is it possible uh, for an average bloke to ride all 21 stages of the Tour de France? The Tour de France is the premier cycle race on the world circuit. Um, it has existed for over 100 years now. It is the biggest race for professional cyclists in the world. It's nominally around three and a half thousand kilometres in length. Generally 21 stages over 23 days. You know, it's the pinnacle of the sport for a cyclist if they win a stage in the Tour de France. Don't even have to win a jersey or something, just winning one of those stages in one of those races is a sort of, you know, career highlight. I needed to get um, a second opinion, uh, someone who's actually ridden the Tour de France. So uh, this guy, of course, was a certain Hayden Ralston. Jonathan just contacted me one day uh, out of the blue. I, I didn't know Jonathan um, and, yeah, he, he told me his sort of plans. You know, we, we had the idea of riding all 21 stages of the Tour de France uh, one day ahead. And it just sort of went from there and as, as time come closer, you know, things started to get more and more serious and I was like, oh, yeah, it's really going to happen. Bruce Thompson, I'm an aircraft technician. I'm an accountant. I work at Victoria University. A project manager for building company. I'm a GP. No, I'm a planning consultant. Yeah, I'm a chartered accountant by profession. Uh, I'm uh, currently unemployed. I uh, left my job to go ride the Tour de France. Make sure all these little bumps, because there's about five little bumps coming up, that everyone just rides up them, you know, just actually enjoy, enjoy it, rather than like stepping on it, because it, it does get harder. And there's no room in the car. <laughs> <laughs> really early on in the piece, I saw an advertisement Johnny had put up to go to ride the 2018 Tour de France. I thought, you know, that looks cool, but then immediately, wrote it off, there's, there's no way I can sort of find the time um, or the money to do something like that. Got it in at work and had a look and thought that just looked stupid, but it sat on my mind uh, for a very long time. And initially I dismissed it, and then I mulled over it for uh, about two or three days, and you go, you know what, you only live once, and really that's not that much in the course of a lifetime, so I uh, rang up Jonathan and see if I could uh, make the grade. I knew he'd get eight guys. I didn't know if they'd be able to complete it, knowing that, you know, some of the professional cyclists take seven hours to complete a, a tough mountain stage in the Tour de France. But, you know, each day will have its own particular challenges, and it may not necessarily be on the bike. It may be sickness, or it may be transfers, or it may be um, the stage itself. There's so many other variables that can come into play. Oh, I'm getting a little bit nervous now. Hasn't really kicked in till uh, it's now stage one. It's about two hours away, so um, yeah. Oh, I think we can take it pretty easy today, so oh, I'd hope maybe seven hours, excluding stops. Maybe eight hours, including stops. Depends how long we have for lunch. So. I mean, it's just, um, I think, a matter of clearing your head as much as anything, uh, making sure that you haven't forgotten anything, got my GPS on, got the course for today loaded, bottles on the bike, sun cream on, chamois cream on. The next days will get easier and easier as we sort of slot into knowing what to do and when and, um, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're ready, so. Study, study. The study as you go the study the study the study as you go Work gets heavy when the heart gets heavy drop the low 
by the way you sigh Keep your head up when the day gets fed up And the night gets longer Study, study, study Study as you go Study, study, study as you go it's just starting to bite that a little bit now after 100 k's. But the, yeah. I just think 100 k's was a long way. Now I think 100 k's is like, oh, that's yeah. the first I mean, half of the first half of the first stage. Who would have ever thought I'd be here doing this? I had a dream when I was a young fella, but yeah, it was never a reality then. It's a bit of a pinch yourself to realise it's actually real and we're doing it. So uh, yeah, very exciting. the end of stage one, which was obviously the first mission. Bloody sensational though. Starting to get a bit emotional. Remembering what it's all for, it's bloody good. Bloody sensational. Uh, I've, I've known a couple of suicides, um, my sister being one. Um, brother and mate of mine also. Um, had other family members that have kind of been touched by mental health, as probably most people have. Mental health has always been a challenge for me and for members of my family. Uh, it's, it's a tough one because it, it's not like you've got a broken arm and people can see it or that you can see it. Part of the reason I wanted to ride was for the cause and to yeah, bring it to the forefront, get people talking about it. The one thing we all had in common was that we'd all been affected majorly or minorly by mental health uh, issues of some sort. I was diagnosed with depression about I think it was seven or, seven or eight years ago. You know, the reason I was there was because of the Mental Health Foundation. The first period is probably the most vital because everyone feels great there. Everyone's a champion in the first half of any stage, the first half of any race, everyone's a winner. But it's not about that, it's actually about getting to the point where people start to tire and still having energy in the muscles. You know, Hayden had told us, just take it easy. Guys, you've got to go really easy on those days. And of course we didn't. this part of it. I knew the Alps are tough and the Pyrenees are up and down, but I didn't appreciate what this was like. Big open roads, little narrow roads, up and down, flat. Don't really know quite exactly how hot it was, but when we stopped, my Garmin said it was 32 degrees. Working on the tan, two days riding. <laughs> it was fascinating to see, you know, the different walks of life Jonathan had found these people. You come up with the idea um, to, to ride all 21 stages. You come up with the idea that it's all for a charity, so you've got your purpose, you've got your goal. Then you've got to do the hard bit, you've got to find the people. First thing was, shit, there's a wide varied range of people here. How's this going to gel together over 23 days in, in pretty trying circumstances? The, there's eight of us um, are basically strangers coming together. Uh, we're doing uh, long days on the bike, all the recipes there to get grumpy and snitchy with each other. I'm introverted and, you know, we'd, we'd wake up in the morning and the moment you open your eyes, 
you know, a teammate would be there, um, we're having breakfast together. And after, you know, two or three days, I was like, man, I'm exhausted. I kind of realised it wasn't, it wasn't exhaustion from the riding, it was exhaustion from the constant company. We knew it was going to get harder, but I really don't think any of us knew exactly how hard it was going to get each day after that. Uh, it's about a 40-minute transfer, so take your water with you. 205 plus the bonus bit with the bonus, so it'll be another 210 day. Let's see. With a lot more climbing. Just under 216 k's. That'll be a record for me today. Uh, and 2,799 vertical meters. So I might just do an extra meter just to uh, round it out to 28. Today is the first, I think, um, tough stage. Uh, quite cool now, uh, but by mid-afternoon it's going to be um, up there in the um, late 20s. Quite a bit of fear, like, holy shit, this is a long day. And it's like, oh, if I get through today, I'll get through today, all right, and then how am I going to feel tomorrow? <laughs> Hey, what do you like on DIT gears? Um, yeah. Not big boy country today. It's on, uh, but it's not enough for dinner last night. Possibly not enough sleep either. And just um, it's not. It's only when I'm in the yeah, feeling a bit bloody. down the cluster. Yeah. She's like riding a sauna out there today. Yeah, right. Well, mm -hmm. as soon as you start going up, the speed drops. <laughs> There's no wind. There's no wind. <laughs> it's like. Ooh. Whatever wind there is, is a headwind. The first few days, the boys were gunning it. <laughs> it was quick. Um, and I didn't speak up. So basically, we were doing some pretty good speeds where I was pretty much redlining. The other boys were cruising-ish. And then we'd had a wee climb. And I'm redlining on the flat, so we had a climb, and those boys just put a little bit more power in, and I've got no power left. At the other end of the cycling spectrum, in some ways, was Aaron, who, you know, has a really storied multi-sport background, but in some ways was was a sort of a novice on the bike. The first few days, you know, we were having you know serious concerns whether we were able to keep up. Most of them are pure cyclists, you know. Most of them are multi-sporters. They're they're out, and out cyclists, and and they looked at <laughs> they look comfortable on a bike. They look natural on a bike, whereas. I was floundering. <laughs> Anything more than a flat, and I sort of started dropping back out the back. So, done, tough mate. day, tough day. Thankfully, a couple of boys helped me out, got me through. Oh, I don't know what I got through. She was a pretty tough out there. I guess the next concern is it's 10 past six, so the rest up here is not going to be huge. So, getting ready for tomorrow is going to be the next mission, really. It's just another day. The biggest thing that the support crew had to face was uh, the lack of time. There's always issues with people's bikes. There's all these things that you're, you're trying to organise on the fly. This is just a very short, I think the first time we've stopped for a coffee break. So, you know, it's well deserved and well earned. A bit of R&R. &R. They like soft breads, they don't like the crusty French loaves, but the boys who do the driving do. And Mike likes 
four crisp sandwiches on soft bread at the end of this ride. Let's go shopping here. We can buy bread, we can buy jam. I push the trolley, you push the pram. So we got the Roubaix stage tomorrow, which is 20 kilometers of cobbles. We're having to put on uh, wider tyres to run over the cobbles that we, should, that we can run at a lower temperature to try and absorb up all the bumps. So this is a really, really important stage, the stage from Arras through to Roubaix, some of the route of the hell of the north. So these cobblestones um, you know, are pretty deep. So these guys are pretty nervous this morning. There's danger of pinch flats, there's dangers of crashes. Don't actually know what they're like. You hear stories about they're huge and they've got gorges between them, but I don't know what we'll find until we get there. Every day there's been some epic aspect to each stage. And today it's cobblestones. And until you've ridden them, you, you cannot begin to understand how much energy they take. There's so much cycling history here. I've never been here before, and it's awesome to just to be here. You know, it almost brings a tear to your eye. The last one, I think, was the worst. Yeah. Rough as guts. We've done yeah. a couple of laps of the velodrome, and um, Roger's organised access to have a look at the old um, the old showers that the fellas traditionally take a, a wash in after Paris Roubaix. For an all-black fan, it would be like going into the changing rooms at Eaton Park. It's, it's a very special place and one of the um, most sacrosanct places in cycling. So these are all the winners of Paris Roubaix over all the years. So you're looking at uh, some of the modern and some of the uh, earlier greats. Oh so yeah, a lot of history in here. So as a cycling fan, like the Holy Grail. It's very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. Epic Astera. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you got one of my bottles. Yeah. Oh, you are legend. You got bottles, bro. Um, you're only 10 minutes, 12 minutes behind the other guys, actually. You can. Thought it'd be way more than that, to be honest. No, uh, I, th I thought you'd be another 5 10 or something. Mikey passed me, but just stopped to take a photo, so he's. Oh, yeah. Do you want both those? <sighs> yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, Paul's the one that's suffering today. The curry that he had last night, I think, has come back to. Well, I hope it's just the curry, otherwise he'll need to be isolated because he'll, if he's got a virus, he'll wipe the rest of us out. Feeling any better? Oh, it's a bit rough today. 
Still feeling a bit sick, can't really hold any food. Yeah. But, um, get your fills up, mate. Three are down, one to go. He's got a bit of a cook gut, and he's battling. He seems as though he's gonna, uh, he's gonna make it all right, but he is struggling a lot today, I think. I couldn't eat. I didn't feel terribly well at all. Bit dizzy, light-headed. I uh, couldn't pack enough energy down, and it ended up being a real struggle. So, and it was it was really hard work. It was hot. Um, I was struggling to get enough fluid in. Really didn't want to eat, though I knew I needed to eat to to have enough energy to get up the hills. Just glad to have made that one. I knew it was going to be a tough stage. I didn't count on having a stomach upset with it. Yeah. <laughs> the real race for them started when the first mountain stage started, and from there, it was you know the strongest, the strongest survive. I sat down and did a calculation. You know, how many tens of thousands of times have I turned the pedal over? Or... That goes through your feet, you know, and there's just something I hadn't kind of credited was that your feet would get sore from all the pressure off the pedals. Just little things you don't expect, you know. I think I probably did more training on hills than anyone else. I think that was basically, there's no secret to it, it's just training. <laughs> and I like the mountains because it's more fun than riding along a flat road, which can get tedious. <laughs> My Garmin's very helpful after 12 minutes of riding, it tells me how I am. Yesterday I said I was good, today I said I was fair. I'm expecting tomorrow to tell me I'm poor. 13 k's to the top, it's only a small one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the body's feeling much better today, so I got a really good night's sleep last night. Um, got lots of food in me. So now all I've got in the stomach are butterflies. It's uh, what, 176 kilometres a day, and they say up around 5,000 metres climbing, so nothing, never done anything close to this before. So. Heavier, but just finish it off. You okay, brother? Yeah.
It's damn hot out there. Fuck, unbelievable. Right, push it out, Karen, Bill. You'll catch me in about three yep. seconds. By the time he got to Hairpin 9 of Alp d'Huez, he just, he got off, he climbed off his bike, sat on the wall and said, um, guys, you go on. I'm going to go, I want to go down to the car park. There's always tomorrow. Johnny came out and, and said, Stu's in a real bad way. Straight away understood, OK, he's not going to get to the top without help. He, he was broken. Uh, he, has, he was mentally exhausted as well as physically, but we persuaded him to get back on the bike and see how he felt at the next hairpin, even if we had to push him up. And so that's what we did. We, we took it in turns to push him up Alpe d'Huez. I trained really, really hard. I hadn't made all of my targets, um, just because work and fundraising and and depression, um, sort of all bit at various times. Um, and I'd sort of, at times, felt like I was over-preparing. But really, that, that was the day it was all for. Um, yeah, that was... It was good to have all that strength that day. I realised we don't choose our emotions. The emotions that I experienced on that stage were nothing I'd ever experienced before on a bike. Yeah, it all came out. Yeah. Awesome. What an emotional day. Hey. Stewie up there, because I know how much of a big thing this is. Really salt ring day. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to be part of a team, eh? It's good. I'm glad we were there for a mate. I feel like my kneecaps are about to burst. <laughs> oh, wow. What a day. 5,000 5, vertical metres. It's about almost 15 times up Wellington's biggest hill. <laughs> oh, shit. 5,000 uh, 5, uh, 5, metre day, Aaron. <laughs> sure was. Never done that before. Hello, Dave. Where's the stop? About seven or eight k. Okay. We've got all these beautiful streams we're crossing, which would be really nice to sit in, but for the fact that there's no water running down them. Are we in a big town tonight? Um, I don't actually know. If we, if there's like a super U or something. Yeah. 
Might be worth getting some clippers. Yeah. Gives a little bit of water. Yeah. So we're just working out. We'll give Stu a bit of a break at lunchtime. We'll have a break in a couple hundred meters. We've got to just come over this coal and then we've got a lunch stop. We'll try and cool him down and then uh, make the game plan as to how we're going to proceed. As soon as you start to climb it, it's that mid 30s, it just, it just takes the energy. The, the legs, legs can take over, but the energy is just, just saps you. Just, if, you go, if you're not out here cycling in 30 plus degrees, you just don't, you don't kind of get what it does to your body, it just, just saps you. Three of the guys have stayed back to help him, uh, push him over the next two hills, and uh, fingers crossed we can get him to the finish, but it's still got another 60k to go another thousand meters of climbing, so it's going to be tough. Stu would have been, in my mind, one of the top two of the strongest guys here. Stu, ex-winner of the Tour of Southland, uh, which is New Zealand's premier race, and he was one of the guys that I looked at and I thought, well, I'm just not in the same league. Stu went over there with the most amazing cycling CV of all of us. That day in Tamond, he folded on hills that he would have had absolutely no problems with. And it was really hard for us because on one hand, you're there and you're going, well, we want everyone to ride the whole tour. But you're on that balancing act of going, oh, are we pushing him too hard that he won't be able to ride any of the other stages will really break him. So it was a real hard balancing act. I'd never seen mountains like that before, or let alone ridden them. I just knew that I wasn't going to give up, I couldn't give up. There was no, no turning back on this one. Moments like that, you really have to dig deep and draw something out of you because it's a brutal, brutal sport. And it's an even more brutal sport when you're not a professional athlete trying to do what the professionals do. When you're down and you've had enough without somebody to actually tell you, get off your bloody ass, get up that hill, I'm not sure that I'd have the willpower to do it. Realistically, the goal was at the end to get everyone around Tour de France, and so you really had to work as a team. No, there's no way you could do it without a team. And it's just new respect for the pro riders and the pro teams and how organised they are and what goes on behind the scenes that no one really sees. That was the good thing about working as a team, was we could all push each other along. We all had our bad days, um, including myself, but uh, there was always one or two hanging back to help those that were struggling to get through, um, and the support team as well, um, helping us out. Thank God it's cooler, that's all I can say. My prayers have been answered. <laughs> I'm amazed at how uh, surprising my emotions have been in the last two weeks. And <laughs> you will have captured that. And I can't explain it. Don't know why. It's just been epic. Stu made a comment at one stage, by that kind of a week or so into it, just day after day of biking, he said, you actually look like you're part of the bike now, whereas previously it looked like you were fighting the bike. It was just so amazing to see this guy who'd been, you know, he'd, he'd never been a cyclist before and, you know, had, had turned into one. I think I grew with the tour. I, I got fitter, I got stronger, I lost some weight. <laughs> if you can shed three or four or five kilos, then that just helps. I did recover and I, I got my confidence back a little bit. Started noticing others having bad days as well. When I needed them, they were there for me. When they needed me, I had to be there for them and that was a 
how the camaraderie grew over the time. Spent energy wise, I was spent mentally, I was spent, I think even emotionally, I was almost uh, in tears riding on the bottom down here with the boys. They didn't know, but I'm like, okay, what? So Bill and Stu there came and rode with me and just said that, just uh, sat there and rode, and I was just in the company was that. I haven't drunk enough beers yesterday, and that's my failure. Uh, but I think it might be early to bed tonight. So uh, last night, I would have given myself a 50% chance to be starting today. Hot and cold sweats. Uh, so yeah, harder stage of the tour and <laughs> not feeling hungry. So we'll see how we go, slowly but surely, hopefully. Um, no one said a dream was easy, so <laughs> see, see what today's challenges bring me. Um, 19 days at the end of the day of some pretty big caves and some pretty big hills. And for a non-cycling specialist, it's been been a journey, that's for sure. Yeah, been, been incredible. First couple of hours, I could just feel my mood dropping. Like, I've really been trying to help using my strength hopefully to benefit others. And I was just, I don't know, feeling um, not as free as I'd kind of hoped, I suppose. And um, I really opened the taps at the bottom of the hill. Felt really good, actually. Just what the doctor ordered. Um, and I feel a lot better now, so yeah, glad I did it. <clears throat> oh, hanging in there. It's a bit of a long way up there. Hey. Is he? One more coal and it's it. It's the final coal down. <laughs> anyway. There's my grind up. There's Madeline's there if you want sugary. Nothing half my problem is too much sugar. Okay. This is the man drinking a Coke. <laughs> Plain water. Two people turned up here, um, quite fresh as daisies. Yeah. Um, those two people were. Guess. Jason. Yeah. Uh, Mr. F well, yeah, Mr. Fish. Yeah. yeah. Um, it turns out that they've gone the wrong way. Have they? They've decided uh, to go back um, around, and they're probably climbing up to that climb you just been over. So they're behind you. The fatigue got to me. I, I, I missed an arrow and carried on for another 40 minutes and got, a, got to a feed station and I, in conversation with Jason, who'd also done the same, we realised that we'd actually missed out one of the major mountain passes. And I said to Roger, are you sure we're in the right place, Roger? He gets his map out and goes, mm, we should have come this way. He said, well, I we didn't come that way. So there was only, only one thing for it, is to retrace our steps, take the the right road and finish the stage properly. And for me, that was a 223 kilometer day with at least five and a half thousand meters of climbing. Sometimes where it got beyond that, where it got to the shit, can I actually make it to the top? Uh, that's where you started digging into the memories of who you were doing it for, what you were doing it for. My father passed away during the year, so it was kind of first Father's Day without him but my sister took her own life on Father's Day, sort of three years earlier. I was diagnosed with depression about seven or eight years ago. 
And so having had this personal experience with depression, I felt like it was gonna give me an opportunity to sort of share that experience with people. Myself with an autistic daughter who's quite severely autistic, it's quite hard to get by sometimes. The issue of mental health was high on the agenda and something special for me. Baby. That is what this has been about. Getting to this point. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. Had some pretty big emotions going through today. You have nothing left in the legs and it just throws a nice gentle little 9% at you or somewhere around there just to just to suck the last little bits out. It's just ticking off the miles. It's like I've come this far. Stoked to be here on the top. Because um, this is really the last bastion, I suppose, once you close this point. Um, failing something catastrophic, um, pretty much all the boys will finish the tour. But yeah, that was a hard day. I don't know. Um, what I'm thinking is that he probably just needs an hour of sleep. So that's, that's the next option that uh, one person, it could even be me, uh, rides with him. Give us five minutes, uh, but I'm thinking that we need to give him an extra hour and a half. Yep. Um, and then he can have a sleep, and then we'll wake him up in an hour, and then um, you two ride with him. Come on, happy. I got him to bed, I think, at 11.30. And then, no sooner had I lied, lay down, than I started feeling the kind of rumbling in my guts. I think at midnight, I was like, oh man, and had to run to the toilet and spent, I think, probably the next hour um, with this kind of crazy diarrhea. Once that settled down, I think it was probably <laughs> two and a half, two and a half hours, you know, just throwing up every, every 15 or 20 minutes, wishing that I'd chewed my pizza a little bit more carefully. John had ended up being the default leader of the group. For someone who had given a lot to the team, it would have been really disappointing to see him not do that stage. It was fantastic to go back to John. John pushed all of us around before that. He was the one that made sure that we all got through. I was so appreciative of how people helped me. It's natural if I saw someone struggling to try and help them too. Well, Johnny's been the big strong man the whole tour and pretty sad to see him get sucked down that way. But he got through, which was awesome. You know, had it not been for the team, basically I would have been jumping on the train to Paris without riding that, that stage, tw stage 20. They've done, uh, done a, a fantastic job. I mean, it's not only epic for them individually, but to, to the level of support that they're giving for what is really an important cause back home in New Zealand is fantastic. I mean, for them to put so much effort into, into this personally and to, to really raise money and support for what's a really good cause is something that's, you know, how can you not get them behind them? They, they've done well. Mixed emotions today. It's the uh, end of adventure. Um, you're not sure what to take, your, take with it. It's, um, yeah, it's all a bit surreal today. So the girls uh, were doing the same thing as we were, so they were riding all 21 stages. The cause that they were riding for was to promote women cycling. The Tour de France is a men's event. So we joined them on the last stage, which was good because they actually had a motorbike um, brigade going ahead and closing off roads.
By the time I got to stage 21, I'd already mentally finished the race. For me, that was, everything hard was over by then, and it was actually a beautiful moment. Really, it was about going on a mission and completing a mission, and a part of the mission was raising funds and awareness about mental health. What your body can do, what your body can handle, what your body is actually capable of is quite phenomenal. Um, 21 days, 23 days with two rests, so 21 days cycling. You know, to get up every day and do 180, 170, 200, 210, and the next day and the next day and the next day was just, it's, you know, I thought, shit, my legs are gonna give at some point. Um, legs never did. When you see it on TV, you really, you don't get a good sense of, of how incredible they are. You know, they're just these, these little skinny guys that are sitting on their bikes looking like they're just out for a, a, Sunday, a Sunday ride. Final stage. Looking forward to that champagne, mate. Put it on the ice. I'm on the way. I didn't think all eight of us would make it round. Uh, not many people thought all eight of us would make it round, I don't think, so. Shows that we all put in the work and shows that what can be done. We joked about how much of an experiment it was, trying to take a bunch of eight amateurs to ride that far and do everything that the pros did, and then also, on the back of that, raise awareness and money. And you get the goosebumps on the back of your neck, and you go, we're gonna do this, we're, we're almost home. Them getting through it and having to go through the challenges they, they face along the way is a real testament to, to them as individuals. They just did the Tour de France. Only the pros do that. Having done it and having uh, devoted seven months training to it, I would say that anyone of my level can do it. But do not underestimate how physically and mentally tough a challenge it is. It is, it is massive, massive. You know, it's, it's been three and a half weeks and we've packed in memories that it takes you two or three years to accumulate in normal, at the normal pace huge uh, achievement for the guys, huge uh, support from all the people uh, back in New Zealand uh, that were following us, uh, all the messages of support. It grew from a common beginning to a, to a family situation. If you'd been out there on your own, struggling, knowing you've got 140k to go and another two mountain climbs and you're struggling now, I think you would have struggled to continue. But having the guys there just got you through.
on the eye.